Hey, hey, everyone, it's your Peacekeeper, and it's time for a premium ship review, and it's going to be one of those ones that is so highly requested that I do. I finally managed to get a game that I'm actually, you know, interested in showing you guys, and uh, this video is checking that off the list, but more importantly, I think that this video is going to be kind of controversial because, quite honestly, I'm not a huge fan of the ship and game right now. Uh, but this ship is the USS Atlanta, and the Atlanta was a ship, the lead ship of a class of eight cruisers, that being Atlanta, Juno, San Diego, San Juan, Oakland, Reno, Flint, and Tucson. Uh, the last four of those ships are frequently considered part of the Oakland subclass, and this whole class actually spawned a whole nother additional couple of classes in the Juno class cruisers, which basically featured the same configuration, but a little bit better optimization for anti-aircraft fire. These ships were originally designed in, in the late 1930s, laid down in 1940, and launched in 1941, but they were primarily intended to be light scout cruisers and destroyer flotilla leaders. But, as I'm sure you guys are all well aware if you're not, look at the main armament and that will tell you these ships saw extensive use as anti-aircraft cruisers in World War II, owing in large part to the fact that there was very little else in the U.S. Navy that had quite this level of 5-inch anti-aircraft firepower. Now, remember all the U.S. fast battleships had five of these turrets per side. Atlanta could bring seven of them to bear at any given point in time, just facing one direction. So you definitely had more AA throw power in five inch gun mounts on board in Atlanta than you did on board like the USS Iowa or the South Dakotas or any of the North Carolinas. So that you can, you can see that, but as an interesting side note to that, the Atlantas never, didn't receive night, uh, radar until 1942, so these ships were using optical rangefinders to track enemy ships and enemy aircraft to engage them, at least until 1942 when they got their radar refits. Of course, <laughs> the, the gun configuration was also extremely unique, too. There was no other U.S. cruisers that really had this layout. In fact, uh, it wouldn't be until we got to the Worcester-class cruisers after World War II that we would see anything resembling this many turrets anywhere on board a ship. Um so that, that configuration, in case, that you know, just to point it out, is going to be three super firing pairs up front. And super firing just means that one, uh, the rearmost turret, can fire over the one in front of it. So you can see all three of these can fire straight ahead. And then it had two wing turrets in the back. And then right behind them was three more super firing turrets in the back. Total of eight dual 5-inch 38 caliber gun mounts. Just an a staggering amount of heavy anti-aircraft fire. The Atlantas were also the only U.S. cruisers commissioned in World War II that were armed with torpedoes. And during their refits in which they received radar, they also received sonar and depth charges owing to their original role as flotilla leaders. In terms of service history, unfortunately, the history of the Atlantis is not all rainbows and sunshine like one would be led to believe based on the staggering amount of 5-inch gun batteries on board. The formidable AA firepower did not fare well in an actual surface engagement. That Those 5-inch guns, they were fantastic guns. However, the only two ships that actually participated in surface actions, that being the Atlanta and Juno, were both sunk, and they would be two of only three U.S. light cruisers sunk during World War II. And by the way, that includes all of our pre-war, like the Omahas, <laughs> that served as well. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's not a good combat record. Unfortunately, that also kind of comes to play true in uh, in this game, too. 
Atlanta, she would go on to fight in the Battle of Midway, the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, and the Battle of Guadalcanal, where she primarily served as an anti-air escort ship. During the Eastern Solomons campaign, she fought alongside Enterprise, delivering a wall of five-inch shells into the air, cl- claiming five of the attacking 18 aircraft during the that engagement. During Guadalcanal, Atlanta participated in a night action in which the Japanese destroyer Akatsuki illuminated the ship from about 1,600 yards. Atlanta turned her guns on to Akatsuki and immediately fired upon and sank her. But during the engagement, she suffered a torpedo hit from either Inazuma or Akatsuki, which were the two destroyers escorting Akatsuki. Soon after being hit by that torpedo, approximately 19 8-inch shells struck Atlanta, fired from the USS San Francisco. Due to the damage, she was brought under tow at day, first day light, and towed until they realized that their damage control efforts weren't going to be able to keep her afloat. The decision was made to sink her via a demo charge. You can actually dive on the Atlanta's wreck today, which is kind of interesting. The USS Juno would go on to become famous because her sinking killed the five Sullivan brothers, which prompted the creation of the Soul Survivor Policy Act, which mandated that the sole remaining survivor of a family that is serving in the U.S. military be discharged from the military and sent home to continue on their family legacy. And the five Sullivan brothers, were they were all five of them. They were the only children that this family had. And all five of them died when the USS Juno sank. And part of that, you know, that same policy was that they couldn't serve on board the same ship anymore. There there was more to it than just that, but that's part of the reason why they're famous. Now, interestingly enough, Juno, that name would go on to be the lead ship of the Juno class of like cruisers, which basically took the Atlanta lopped off our two wing turrets back here and used that as an anti-aircraft, basically floating anti-aircraft barge, much in the way that the Atlantas were used. In terms of their in-game play style, Atlanta is by far one of the most frustrating ships to play. She is the epitome of island camping and smoke camping shenaniganry that a lot of U.S. cruisers are forced into that play style. Unfortunately, she has absolutely zero, zero durability at all. And if you can't find yourself some hard cover to hide behind or some smoke to take advantage of, she just, you can't use the guns. You have to stay in stealth. And if you're spotted, man, God help you, because you're just going to get melted. She has basically no armor. In fact, as a tier seven cruiser, I think the only one that has worse armor is Pensacola and only just barely worse, mind you. Oh, to add insult to injury, those 5-inch guns don't even have the rate of fire that the real 5-inch 38 Cal Mark 32 gun mounts had. She is limited to a 12 rounds per minute firing cycle instead of the 15 to 20 that was observed in real life. And part of that is a quote-unquote balancing act. But wait, there's more reasons why this ship is frustrating to play. Being the only U.S. light cruiser commissioned in World War II to have torpedoes, they only go four and a half kilometers. <laughs> They're basically useless. Why? War gaming. And then their firing arcs are even worse than that. I mean, I, there's just really no... <clears throat> I don't know. I, I struggle to find a real upside to the ship outside of the fact that she has very potent AA, especially for a tier seven cruiser. I don't think there's anything else at tier seven that even comes close to having this level of AA firepower. She does get radar, which I suppose is an advantage. However, that radar is relatively short ranged. It's obviously short duration And without heavy cover between you and the things you're going to inevitably spot, there's a high probability that it will win that fight. And that that's (laughs) it makes hunting down destroyers kind of dangerous, especially if they're if you're up front in front of all of your ships. You've got to be really careful where you push and where you don't push and what what areas you push into, because you have to pre plan about four minutes ahead to make sure that you get to some hard cover 
so that you don't just take a whole bunch of fire. She also does receive defensive fire, and the defensive fire consumable has no charges, meaning you cannot run out of defensive fire charges. It is still worth taking, in my opinion, the premium upgrade for it just so that it reloads a little bit quicker. Uh, that way you can use it more often, actually a lot quicker. <laughs> Wow, that's a big difference. So I definitely recommend taking the premium, even though you don't need it for the extra. It just helps with the reload. And given that this ship's one of the ship's strong suits or any aircraft capabilities, it's definitely worth having uh, that quicker reload. The other interesting part of this is like the U.S. destroyers, at close range, her 5-inch AP shells should not be taken lightly. Lightly armored cruisers engaging Atlanta at close range Definitely need to pay attention to how much broadside they are showing because her main battery, even with a five second reload time, will absolutely melt any light cruisers. In fact, if you are a Royal Navy cruiser and you're facing off against an Atlanta, it would behoove you to make sure that you are not presenting anything resembling a broadside profile. If you are a heavy cruiser and you're engaging Atlanta within her torpedo range, it would also behoove you not to expose that broadside. You definitely want to stay angled so that that 5-inch AP can't penetrate. But if she does get a ship broadside, that 5-inch AP can definitely rack up some damage. Also, the rate of fire with the sheer number of guns means that the ship does start a decent amount of fires, which is very, very, very nice. She does have an 8% fire chance. I think that's going to be including Demo Expert. Yep, on the, on the captain. And if I remember correctly, she also has the signal flag for the increase in fire chance. So, yes. Yes, she does. So, definitely got to account for that. Uh, that's a couple more percentage points that added into there. So, I think base 4 or 5%. But still, with, with the right specs, you can turn this thing into an absolute blowtorch. All right. Let's dive into the stats. In terms of hit points, she has 27,500 hit points. Her main belt is only 89 millimeters thick, and unfortunately, it is right over top of an above water citadel. Her main hull plating is only 13 millimeters thick, and it doesn't step in any place except for the magazines here where it's 51 millimeters. Uh, it, this. This right here is bad news. I mean, just about any 8-inch shell is going to penetrate through into the Citadel spaces on board this ship. And you can see here with this 89 front, 89 millimeter front bulkhead, there's basically no angle at which you can be safe from any heavy caliber weaponry, especially since this Citadel sits above water. And you don't have any smoke to help either, which means if you, that's part of the reason why you need hardcover. You need an island or another ship, if you, for, if you will, uh, to really help you out. Smoke will work, too, if there's no radar cruisers around. Uh, main battery, we got eight of these dual 5-inch 38 caliber gun mounts. Again, they're mounted in a, a interesting configuration. You've got three up front, two wing turrets in the middle, and then three out back, you can bring a maximum of 14 5-inch uh, guns to bear with a broadside. They do have actually have a pretty reasonable firing angle, so you can be pretty well angled and bring them all to bear. However, I, I'm just going to tell you right now that with how thin this ship's armor is, it's really not worth mentioning angling. Uh, if anything, angling is actually probably a larger detriment to you than sailing broadside. I would never argue for sailing broadside in a ship, but sometimes I, I think the ship survives better when sailing broadside than she does uh, sailing angled because it just there's just too much ship there to get normal pens on. Uh, they do have a 13.3 kilometer main battery firing range. This has also been nerfed from previous builds, and that is going to include advanced firing training on the captain. Uh, this is not a dedicated Atlanta captain, just an FYI. And um, torpedoes. She does have two quad launchers. They are mounted amidships here, one on each side. So you got four torpedoes on each side. Four and a half kilometer range, 65 knot speed. They do do 16,633 damage. And they have a 1.3 kilometer detection range. So if you can ambush an enemy ship with them, you can definitely do a lot of damage. 
AA gun defense. She has eight 20 millimeter Orlikens. She has four of these quad 28 millimeters. These are the 1.1 inch Chicago pianos. Interestingly enough, these were actually removed in favor of 40 millimeter Bofors. Go figure. But we get this ship in its configuration at the time of its sinking, which included those 1.1 inch guns. And then, of course, all of those 5 inch 38 guns. Now, with advanced firing training, but without the anti aircraft range module, let me make sure here. Oh, I've got it. Okay, so I do have it. 7.2 kilometers is the max range for your anti-aircraft bubble. That's pretty impressive. Um, and, and then it steps down from there to 4.4 and then 2.9 kilometers. And with defensive fire, this 133 DPS is just nuts. Max speed of 34.1 knots, however, that is going to include the speed flag. It should be 32 and a half without. Yep. A 610 meter turning radius, 6.7 second rudder shift time, concealment range with concealment expert and concealment um, camo is going to be 9.4 kilometers and by sea and 5.6 by air. In terms of upgrades, ugh, main armaments mod one is absolutely critical. Those five inch guns just get taken out way too easily, even with preventative maintenance. If you were to have it on the captain, I don't on this one. I have expert loader because it's my Des Moines captain. But um, yeah, definitely take main armaments mod one. AA guns mod two would be my recommendation here. However, uh, I don't know. Aiming systems mod one, you can make a pretty good case for it if you wanted to. In the third slot, I'm taking propulsion systems mod one over steering gears mod one for the sole reason of losing your engines is a bigger detriment to me than losing steering is. Um, if I lose my engines, I am a sitting duck, which is not a good thing in this ship. If I lose my steering, I'm forced to run in a circle or in a straight line, depending. That could be good, that could be bad. Hopefully I have my damage control party at the ready so that it's not a problem. In the last slot, uh, you can make a pretty solid case for either propulsion mod two or steering gears mod two. The reduction in rudder shift time to me is always going to be more important, especially on cruisers, than the engine modification. But because this ship likes to spend most of its time behind islands, you could definitely make a solid case for running this ship with Propulsion Systems Mod 2. So those are my recommendations. In terms of captain skills... Um, I'm using my Des Moines here. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here because I have a whole video on, you know, captain skills. A couple things. One, basic firing training. I would, if, if I were to build a dedicated Atlanta captain, basic firing training would be on here. I would still keep advanced firing training. Uh, I would try and find a way for concealment expert or manual fire control for AA. One of these two skills. And I, really, there's... <sighs> There's really not too many other changes I would make except for maybe taking expert loader out and throwing in preventative maintenance or priority target. But overwhelmingly, I think this build works out pretty well for me in terms of being able to, you know, use this, this ship effectively. So anyway, let's dive into a battle video. All right, so this battle is going to be a very interesting battle. Um, it is a tier seven fight. No, it's a tier eight fight. I'm thinking of a different battle. This is a tier eight fight and it is on estuary, which is a fantastic map for this ship. Actually, uh, again, big islands, lots of places to hide. You can't argue with that. We do have an, another STW member in the, in the match, but, um, we are not in a division, nor was I in TeamSpeak when this happened, so we can't even claim that. There's no aircraft carriers, unfortunately, but there's a lot of battleships. There's a fair number of destroyers. Their team actually has four destroyers. I think they traded a cruiser for that. Yes, they did. And um, on this map, I, I there's a there's a good case to be made for destroyers. There's enough open spaces on this that you really need a destroyer to kind of lead the way, put some smoke down. That way, you know your your ships have a you know a, an avenue of approach. Now, my goal on this map is to go over here towards A, since it's where I'm at, and we got two islands here that are coming right at the DE line in the the third. So D and E3, both. The, those, those islands right there are 
uh, very, very good places to hide with Atlanta. You've got the typical 5-inch 38 caliber gun arcs, which means you can shoot over pretty much any island in the game, especially the taller ones, which makes this ship very, very interesting. There's a lot of islands that you can sit behind and shoot from. In fact, on the map Trident, the very famous one in the middle, not the super tall one, but the one in the middle on the northern side, if you can get behind that island, you can pretty much beat yourself and shoot over it <laughs> for the majority of the, the, you know, shooting at the majority of the southern part of the map. That's really interesting to play that way. All right, so we got a La Galassonne here. We are going to try see if we can't burn our French baguette and see if we can't uh, turn him into a toast. But we definitely want to help our Akatsuki. Interestingly enough here, we're going to be assisting the destroyer that uh, we sank. <laughs> um... We're going to help him try and cap here. You do have radar. Uh, with the premium consumables, you have four. Now, I, I'm I'm kind of got myself positioned a little too close to this island here for what I originally wanted to do. It's fine for shooting at ships on the other side of their islands. The problem, you're going to see it pop up here in a second, but there is a little bit of a problem with being this close. So we have an Ernst Gade, and you can see I can't shoot over this island because I'm just too close to it. I needed to be just a little bit further back, but because I don't want to lose our Akatsuki if I can avoid it, I definitely want to get around this island and see if I can't help. We've got radar. We want to save it. It does have a relatively short range. I want to say it's like 7.8, I think, kilometers. Either way, uh, we want to use it at the last moment, especially since nobody knows I'm here except for that. I mean, they, he knows I'm here, I guess. The Legalasagne definitely gave it away. So there's our radar. We popped our radar. And Mr. Gade, he's definitely getting spooked by this. But look at what else popped up in this. We, we also found ourselves an Akatsuki, which means there's another destroyer over here. And down goes the Gade. La Galassonne is running. Akatsuki, come play with me. A Sims? Man, we, we are like in destroyer heaven here, but we have a huge problem. We are not in smoke. We are a giant sitting target and watch the hit point pool this is this is five inch gun shooting at me here from the the sims I, I i my radar is down unfortunately and look at look at that he just lops off 2400 damage with three shell hits there oh managed to avoid the shells there from a nagato and look at these torpedo arcs not really all that fantastic you have to be basically broadside to use them with a 4.5k range, probably not going to hit that Sims, but if he decides to come out and chase me, I'll definitely have the opportunity to do, you know, he, th they could have a possibility of hitting. Now, because I'm not detected, because the Legalasagne disappeared behind the island there, and because the Sims is currently sitting in smoke, and because the Akatsuki is who knows where, uh, we're going to see if we can't push the Sims a little bit. Now, I, my original plan was to go back into A, then I realized, no, there's a lot of really bad things over here. I should probably not stay around here for too much longer. Uh, so we're, we definitely are going to take advantage of the ships that we got sitting here. And we're going to try and duck in between these two islands here. Look at those torpedo arcs. Really not very good. Briefly detected there by aircraft. I went ahead and popped a defensive fire consumable to get that uh, scout plane out of there so that I don't take an insane amount of damage. Quick turn in there. That helped us avoid taking further damage. 30 seconds on the torpedo reload. It's so friggin' long. My goodness. Uh, there's really, like, not... You can tell I'm a bit frustrated with, with the way this ship plays sometimes. Look at 5k damage. We got 12 hits there. Can't argue too much with that. And another 12 hits with that one. Ooh, down goes the Calasagne. There's the Sims. Well, Mr. Destroyer, you, sir, are in a bad place. If I had to... Wow, look at that. Oh, jeez. Duck and weave. <laughs> All right, turrets. Don't fail me now. Turret Traverse on this thing is really quite good. Definitely no complaints there about that. We launched a set of torpedoes there thinking maybe he will uh, turn into those, but I think he called my bluff a little early. And last salvo that we're going to get off on him, but conveniently we're in this really awesome place where look at what's over there. Oh, well, hello there, Mr. Nagato. 
Why, please, sit there, broadside. I would love to burn you. And watch, you know, there, there's some things you gotta watch with this. So I've got my hard cover. That's important. We're up to 42,000 damage. We've we've killed off one destroyer. We got a Sims here that's gonna... What What is he doing? What is he doing? Switch to the rear guns. Come around this corner. I dare you. Oh, he's turning away. Man, that, that sucks. <laughs> I, I really like it when these the guys decide to come around these so I can, uh, you know, get some good hits on them. But look at how much island you can shoot over. If you plan this correctly, you can actually shoot pretty far over most of these. Now, my original goal here was to turn around and use the Sims smoke against him. And you're going to see that, well, we're going to be able to we're going to be able to do some things with it. I'm going to shoot into the smoke. You never know. Ooh. What is he doing? Well, I think the Benson proximity spotted him, but down goes the Sims. And that's always good news. Can't complain too much about that. Well, that's one less destroyer in this match. Oop, torpedoes. Come on, Benson, don't die. That would be even worse news. Oh, Nagato is sailing broadside. We launched, thought he, or uh, sorry, was stationary. So we're going to slow back down again, and the whole reason I'm doing this is is quite simple. Well, we've got smoke here. I want to take advantage of that, but more importantly, Nagato is sitting here sailing quite broadside to me. My radar is almost up, and uh, a quick look on the map. Oh, I'm detected. What does that mean? That means that there's got to be a destroy. Well, look at that. There's an HSF. Harakaze over there. That brief... Yes, there he is. Okay, so we've been spotted by the Harakaze. And, well, look at the turret traverse and how quickly Mr. Harakaze is going to regret his decisions. I don't know what gun configuration he's using, but uh, it's not going to matter much. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so he's using the... Looks like those are the 5-inch guns from the U.S., I don't remember, but it don't matter. <laughs> you, you don't, uh, you don't just come out from behind an island in front of an Atlanta and expect to survive that engagement in the destroyer. Like it just, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> I mean, unless you catch him completely, you know, complete. I actually, I shouldn't say that because I've got a video in which I've got a Sims where I've chased down an Atlanta. I've been saving it for another epic battle montage if I ever get around to doing that. But we're starting this Nagato on fire, though. Racking up the damage here. He's getting a little frustrated, I can tell. He's starting to turn away. So we need to change our point of aim. And remember, look at the shell flight time. You got 12, almost 13 seconds of flight time here. So you need to plan accordingly with your shells. And any change in direction that he's going to make is going to help him evade you for that much longer. The other thing that we're running into here is really damage saturation. I'm praying for another fire because that would absolutely help. We need to probably give ourselves a little bit more lead. Oh, come on. Sink already, Nagato. It's almost over anyway. 1,700 hit points. 1,200. Two, oh, somebody else got the kill. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Well, we're up to 92,484 damage anyway. Pretty solid game, I'm not going to lie. So now we've got um, a bunch of ships. We've got one destroyer, a cruiser, which I think is a Mogami. And we've got Amagi and Bayern over here. So we're gonna shoot up Bayern. Look at how, look at this, look at how those clear that island. I can engage this Bayern, he can't see me. And so long as you can accurately judge the, you know, the fall, you can shoot at him and hit him. And look at the, just look at how much range there is to clear that mountain. Oh my, like they need to make the this just a smidge taller. So we got a, a Magi over here. I've transitioned again because my goal with this is to not be out in the open for this Byron to shoot at if I can avoid it. A Magi is behind an island. He's being spotted by a uh, cruiser, our Mogami. Uh, actually, that's the SDW guy. We've got a Magi on fire once, so we're racking up some fire damage here. And we could possibly get another kill. Can we? Come on. Come on, 290. Oh, <laughs> as you can see, I've been screwed out of my Kraken in this battle. 95,963 damage. We've managed to get three caps. 
Uh, I'm in a perfect position to actually engage this Byern with torpedoes, but I have a feeling this match is going to be over before uh, before this gets any further. Yep, so we, they lost their destroyer. 982 points. Ooh, we're getting close. My original thought was to kind of loop around the side here and see if I couldn't get him, but we're going to launch our torpedoes just as the match... Well, we were getting ready to launch our torpedoes just as the match is ending. And there's the end of the match. Overall, this match definitely plays to the strong suits. 95,963 damage. We got three kills, eight fires, 7,307 XP, 2,376 base XP. However... I'm not a big fan of this ship. I just don't like this like uber passive play style where I'm sitting behind an island. It just doesn't suit my playing of cruisers very well. And for that reason, I really don't care for the ship. She has some strengths, but mostly a lot of weaknesses. Anyway, I'm your peacekeeper. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you for watching.